Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and as is true of every profession, there are some extraordinary figures who have a gift and a talent beyond the ordinary. This is true about rabbis as well. There are especially gifted rabbis whose intellect and charisma elevate them and the people they serve in ways that reveal special truths about the world in which we live, the genius of the Jewish tradition, and can bring us closer to a hint of the divine. And lucky, lucky us, on this edition of the Chaim, I have the enormous privilege and honor of sitting with such a rabbi. What a pleasure it is to introduce you to Rabbi Mark Angel, who for some 40 years served one of the leading synagogues in America, the historic Spanish-Portuguese synagogue in New York City, also known as Sheriff Israel. Let me tell you a little bit about Mark Angel. He received his smicha from Yeshiva University and went on to become one of the shining lights of the Orthodox rabbinic community, later serving as president of the Rabbinical Council of America, the organized organization of Orthodox rabbis. He's the author of more than 30 books, one won a National Book Award for a, for a, book, a wonderful book entitled The Orphaned Adult Understanding and coping with grief and change after the death of our parents. He also was a National Book finalist for his book on the foundations of Sephardic spirituality, and again for his book on Maimonides, Spinoza, and intellectually vibrant Judaism. Mark Angel is also a novelist, and his most recent nonfiction work is a new commentary to Pirkei Avot, published by Koren Books, and in 2007, Mark Angel founded with Rabbi Avi Weiss, an association of modern Orthodox rabbis called the International Rabbinic Fellowship. But perhaps most important of all, as he transitioned to becoming a rabbi emeritus of Sheriff Israel in 2007, Mark Angel founded and is now the director of the Institute for Jewish Ideas and Ideals to foster a vibrant, compassionate, and inclusive expression of Orthodox Judaism. And he's also the publisher of the Institute's journal entitled Conversations. And Mark Angel, it is so wonderful to have you at this table. Thank you for joining us on L'Chaim. Thank you for that very gracious introduction. Probably more than I deserve, but thank you. You also wrote The Crown of Solomon in 2014. Yes. You, it's supposed to be a novel. It's, it is autobiographical, is it not? This is really a book of short stories. I wouldn't say autobiographical, but every time an author writes, something of himself or herself gets mixed into the, into the ingredients. Okay. You grow up in a Sephardic household. I did. What's the tenor of your Jewish home growing up? Oh, when I grew up, it was, um, we lived in the, the central district of Seattle in those days. Most of the Jews of the city lived there. And I knew it was a Jewish neighborhood because everyone spoke Spanish. <laughs> Ladino, <laughs> Judeo-Spanish. At every block, there were two, three, four Sephardic families. We all lived within a mile, mile and a half radius. So my mother came from a family of seven children, my father from a family of eight children, and we all lived within the same neighborhood. And we were always in and out of each other's houses, into our grandparents, our uncles and aunties. It was really like a, a great extended family. Oh, wonderful. I, in fact, growing up uh, in those days, it, Judaism was so much fun and so exciting I could never imagine why anyone would ever leave it. it. Just How could you live without it? It was so good. I make a joke, but it's not quite a joke, that the first time I met a neurotic Jew was when I came to New York. Uh -huh. <laughs> in Seattle, everyone was laid back, happy, easy, comfortable. It was a very happy life. Okay, but Mark, Judaism was fun for you. Fun is a correct way to say it, yes. Describe the fun. Where was the fun? Sephardic Jews like life. We don't, uh, when people make jokes about guilt and Jewish guilt, he didn't reply to, doesn't refer to Sephardim. Sephardim have a very positive attitude on life. They, we enjoyed singing, we enjoyed dancing, we enjoyed family gatherings, eating, colorful, uh, you know, colorful things. Uh, my grandmother used to 
um, burnt orange peels on, the, on her stove. The house would always smell you know, redolent with beautiful smells. It was just happy. We used to have parties for every occasion. In fact, uh, when our own kids were growing up, we used to go back to Seattle every summer, as long as my parents were alive. And uh, our kids grew up thinking Shabbat was a party time because the house was always full of guests. My mother always, may she rest in peace, was a wonderful cook. She always baked special things for Shabbat. So the house was always full. It was Shabbat party time. That's lovely. Yeah. Shabbat was yes, not no. Shabbat was yes, 100%. 100%. 100% yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, you always weren't supposed to do certain yes, things, yes, yes. but it but wasn't the, noticeable. Right, the feeling the overall was, tenning yes. was The overall tenor was this is a really a happy way to live life. You know, there are many Jews who grow up thinking Shabbat's all about no. Correct. That's mm -hmm. why I didn't really realize that until I came to New York. Mm -hmm. Um, I went to public school in Seattle for high school and then came to Yeshiva in New York in 1963. Okay, so what motivates you first to go to Yeshiva and then to actually choose the profession of the rabbi? A number of my friends had come to Yeshiva and it, w it was good. So I came to Yeshiva, but my goal was to uh, study literature and to become a PhD in English literature. That was my real goal. And when I was a senior in uh, college, um, I got a fellowship to the University of Washington in literature. I was also just engaged to my wife. We were going to get married that summer in 1967. My, sister, my wife was a New Yorker, and she didn't want to leave her family. She didn't want to go all the way to Seattle to live. Um, at that time also, my teacher was Chacham Solomon Gaon of Blessed Memory at Yeshiva. Chacham Gaon was head of the Sephardic program, and he had been a Sephardic chief rabbi in, in, uh, in England. And Chacham Gaon came to me one day and said, you need to go to be a rabbi. We need Sephardic rabbis. I said, I'm really interested in literature. He said, well, you can do both things. Go to the rabbinical school and go to school in literature, and you'll see how life unfolds. So that's what I did. I enrolled in the rabbinic program, which made my wife very happy at Yeshiva. And then I also enrolled in a master's program in English at City College, which I got a master's also in literature. And then at the end of the second year in rabbinical school, um, Sherith Israel needed a student rabbi. And we were very poor, and it was a job. So I said, okay, for one year, we'll try it. And that was the end of it. For one year, I'm still there. <laughs> I'm a rabbi emeritus after 46 years or so. Marvelous. So, yeah. So once I got into it, I... I uh, yes, that, you know, it occurs to me as I hear your story. Somebody says to you, we need a Sephardic rabbi. It wasn't that it emanated out of your soul. Not at all. But at some point, it became your soul. Once I started in the uh, rabbinate, I didn't realize how much I would like it. And uh, the people put up with me. And it gave me um, a framework where I could still write and I could still do my research and reading. It, it was a wonderful framework, but it also gave me a chance to devote myself more to the Jewish people specifically and my community and the Sephardic world in general. In those days, and still to a certain extent in these days, the general Jewish population doesn't understand much about Sephardim. Well, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say there was overt discrimination in my day, but there were a lot of unpleasant things said uh, stereotypes. I would say I, I had a lot of unpleasant experiences in my day. And you would think by now, it, the we would, next generation, two generations, if things would get better, and to a certain extent they are, but to a certain extent they still aren't. People don't understand if you came from Turkey, if you come from the Muslim countries, you come from Morocco. Uh, if you're not from those part of the world, you don't understand that culture, then people have uh, often very negative stereotypes. Yes. I want you to talk about that a little bit for me now. And and it, it was one of the major themes that I really hoped you talk to, the extent to which the Ashkenazic Jewish community really does not understand who the Sephardim are. Most of us don't understand even what the differences are in Sephardic ritual and Sephardic custom as opposed to Ashkenazic, mm. that when one attends a Sephardic Seder, while there is an overall sense that you're at, at the same kind of event that you would be in an Ashkenazic home, there are significant differences between an Ashkenazic Seder and a Jewish Seder in terms of some of the symbolism. Also, the liturgy, which is very similar, also is different. How would you explain to the Ashkenazic community that has never been at Sherith Israel, has never attended a Sephardic Seder, what is Sephardic Judaism as opposed to or in contrast to Ashkenazic Judaism? I love your question because it opens up a whole, uh, whole new discussion. There's no such thing as the Sephardic world, just like there's no such thing as the Ashkenazic world. Good for you. The, the Rebbe of Satmer 
is an Ashkenazic rabbi, and the Rabbi Temple of Emmanuel is an Ashkenazic yes. Jew. And there's tremendous, Ashkenazim are not one thing, there are a lot of things. And the same Sephard, is true. Same is true of Sephardim. He's a, a Sephardic Jew from Ladino speaking background in Turkey is very different from a Sephardic Jew from uh, Baghdad of an Iraqi speaking background, or even different from a Jew from Morocco or, or Syria. Each group has its own history, traditions, culture. It's not one thing. Sherith Israel is a Western Sephardic tradition going back to Amsterdam. So most Sephardim are not from that tradition. I'm not by birth. The Western Sephardic tradition would be parallel to, among the Ashkenazim, the German tradition. Very formal, Western music, a choir, elegance. So that's, that's very special and beautiful. And I served the congregation for many years with great honor and joy. But it's not the one that I grew up with. I grew up among Sephardim of Turkish background and Rhodes, which was basically Turkey in those days. And the music is different, the sound is different, the experience is different, and each group is different. Um, so first of all, sometimes people say, well, oh, I know about Sephardim, I have a Yemenite son-in-law. Well, Yemenite's not even Sephardic, Yemenite's different. Uh, not, Sephardic really literally means uh, from Spain. Uh, we call it a pan-Sephardic world, almost everybody from Muslim countries somehow, Jewish people from Muslim countries somehow fit into the overall mm -hmm. Sephardic rubric. And what about Persian Jews? Persian Jews are, there, are Persians. They're Iranian Jews. They've been there much before uh, Sephardic Jews. There was such a thing as Sephardic Jews. And Babylonian Jews, for that but matter. But they self-identify They self-identify because that's the most convenient thing to identify. It's too hard to keep making so many divisions. But in Israel, they, they popularized the phrase Edot HaMizrach, Eastern communities. And that represents Iraqis, Iranians, uh, Afghanistanis, uh, Jews from North Africa, whatever. That's, that's another thing that I always considered a, uh, an important mission of mine was to try to resuscitate this wonderful Sephardic tradition and make it more accessible to Sephardim and Ashkenazim and to non-Jews. Mm -hmm. And that's why much of my writing has been on Sephardic themes. Yes. But I also would like to just take one little diversion here. The Sephardic, it's not Sephardic, I'm not Sephardic in an ethnic sense. I don't believe in that the Sephardic tradition belongs to Sephardim. I believe Sephardic tradition is part of the Jewish people. Just like I would be an incomplete Jew if I didn't know about the Hasidic movement, or I wouldn't be a complete Jew if I didn't know about the Vilna Gaon, or if I didn't know about uh, Abraham Geiger, or didn't know about other, uh, you know, the German uh, Jewish philosophers. So likewise, no Jew is full if they don't know about Sephardic tradition. It's part of, we're one people, and we have different dimensions and different experiences as a people. So one of my goals in my life has been to try to push the Sephardic agenda, not as an ethnic thing, but as something that belongs to all the Jewish people, and there's something for all of us to learn from. Some things we should leave behind, agreed. But some things are valuable and important, and they can be of meaning to ourselves and to our next generations. So I think part of my orthodoxy has been also uh, through Sephardic eyes. When I founded my Institute for Jewish Ideas and Ideals, it's, I subtitled it, uh, an organization to foster an intellectually vibrant, compassionate, and inclusive Orthodox Judaism. But in fact, that's really the mission of, it's a Sephardic mission. The Sephardic part is intellectual vigor, vitality, openness to different opinions, tolerance, recognition other people have different ideas. We still talk to them. We're still part of the same world, it's part of the same team. Compassionate, inclusive, those are ideas that I got I think very much through my Sephardic upbringing. That's lovely. So I think the orthodoxy that I envision is very much seen through the rose-colored glasses of a Sephardic Jew. Well, good for you. Not that Ashkenazim don't have that vision. They also have it. But I think I bring something else to the table that yes, others don't. but speak to that for one more moment. In some way, you've seen the Jewish community, how it operates now. It is very polarized. Mm. And where does that polariz polarization come from in your mind? And what would you like to see us do about it? Uh, Does it trouble you? It troubles me immensely. Not that the Jewish people haven't had polarization over the generations, since the time of Moses. But there's something had. different here. I think it's gotten worse. I think that's why I retired from the rabbinate as early as I did. In other words, the, in our synagogue, the tradition was the rabbis, my predecessors went to age 70. When I was 60, I decided I did a wonderful career. I loved the synagogue. Everything was beautiful. But I figured I, I, there's something, I felt choked. I felt that orthodoxy was becoming narrower, more uh, strident, that the barriers between us, between the orthodox and non-orthodox were fraying. 
I felt that the tone of the discussions is more calling names, yelling at rather than talking with. So I decided with consultation with my wife that I wanted to retire early so that I don't have to go out in a wheelchair, but I could create a new career for myself, try to find out what else I could do with my life in a second uh, rabbinet. And so this, the institute was my goal. And we have a cyber rabbi, a cyber rabbi now. We have thousands upon thousands of members all over the world. And um, our journal reaches many thousands of people. Our website got about 20,000 visits last month. So we are generating something. And our whole goal is not we're right and you're wrong. Our whole goal is, yeah, of course we're right. I mean, everyone, everyone thinks they're right. But I'm willing to listen to you. Maybe you have something to say that I can learn from. And maybe I have something to say you can learn from. But if we yell at each other, neither of us is going to advance. If we listen to each other, even if I disagree with everything you say, there'll be 1% residue that will be in my mind that'll make me think more clearly or more differently about what I think is true. And the goal of my institute really is to make people think better. When I founded the journal, I called it Conversations. I call it Conversations because I want people to talk. We don't print articles that are party line articles. Some are, but a lot of them are controversial. A lot of them, people will agree, disagree. I want you to talk about it. I don't want you to yell about it. I don't want you to call anyone names. I want you to realize there are different opinions out there. And if you would realize that, legitimate opinions by intelligent people, you'll sit back a little bit, just a second, before I'm so judgmental, maybe I should listen. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's some, some common area of discussion that we can entertain. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's really what I've been after. But I think the tone also is being set by what happens in Israel. When you have very, very right-wing religious parties that get political power. So they're entitled to their beliefs. They're entitled to whatever they want to do. But they're not entitled, in my opinion, to impose their views on everybody else. And what happens when you have coalition governments, such as the current government in Israel, um, they get way, way too much power. So you have a very small group within the Jewish world, not just the Orthodox world, within the Jewish world, who are controlling very key things on Jewish identity, who is Jewish, who can get married. I mean, these are very powerful things. And they're deciding it by standards which 95% of the Jews don't accept and don't need. And even Orthodox Jews, there are choices to make. Instead of having the broad toolbox of choices available, this group chooses the most stringent, the most rigid, the most narrow interpretations, and then they impose it on everybody else. So this creates also um, hostility. So those who are not Haredi, or at least very right wing, get, they get mad at the Haredim. The Haredim call the rest of us Goyim. And it, it, it breaks down. Mm -hmm. By the way, you say it beautifully. It's also interesting. I hope people heard what you just said at the very end. The Haredim call you, an Orthodox rabbi, a Goy. They do. Yes. I don't know if they use exactly the word uh, yes, Goy. But I know but what you mean. They discredit yes. us. Yes. In other words, in other words, if we don't they follow don't their rules, right. if we don't follow exactly the way they do, we're, we're not, we're not to be counted. They wouldn't accept our conversions. They wouldn't accept this. They wouldn't accept that. Even though you're Orthodox. Even though we're Orthodox. And even though we do everything and sacrifice our whole lives morning, noon, and night for, for Torah and Mitzvot, for them it's nothing because mm -hmm. we don't have big black hats and long beards. Yes. And how do you feel about non-Orthodox streams of Judaism in America, the conservative movement, the Reconstructionist movement, the Reform movement? Here's my problem. My problem is when I was a young rabbi, I got very involved with the UJA Federation of uh, New York. In those days, it was just federation. And we used to sit at meetings with Orthodox, conservative, Reform rabbis and laymen, and we dealt with issues relating to the community. It didn't have to do with, with the Orthodox or Reform. It had to do with questions of intermarriage, questions of how to deal with singles, questions of, of premarital counseling, questions of poverty, questions of drug abuse. And we talked about problems that affected the whole Jewish community without focusing on our particular theology. And in that context, we became very, very close friends and allies not working as Orthodox or as Reform or as Conservative, but working as Jews who care about the community. And some of the best friendships of my whole life are, are people who are certainly not Orthodox and who are very active or Reform or Conservative rabbis and lay people, and people that I love and respect and admire. So later on, you ask me, well, do I believe in Reform or Conservative Judaism? No, no, no. I'm Orthodox. Do I therefore hate Reform or Conservative Jews? How can I? I love them. <laughs> I've sat with them. I work with them. They're good people. How can, how can I pass judgment on people that I know? So I think part of our problem that we're having today is there's been a breakdown in communication between different segments of the population. If you talk to somebody eye to eye, 
it's hard to hate them. Because you see, there's a real human being there. That person has fears, anxieties, love, cares, children, grandchildren. There's so much that brings us together. We're human beings. When you talk to people and work together on common problems, you feel a sense of kinship. Okay. But you're talking about the relationship you have with individuals. But though, once you I have... asked you what was your view of the expression of Jewish pluralism when it is, when it is articulated in a Reform theology or conservative theology or reconstructionist, none of which have the commitment to halakha that you have. Right. I don't share their, their views. I certainly don't. I'm right. not a Reform Jew. I'm not a conservative Jew. If right. I thought if I believed they were right, I would be them. I don't. I don't agree with the them. The question is, do you do you discredit them? Chas v'shalom. God forbid. You shouldn't forget. For, I'm saying you shouldn't discredit any Jew. But I think one of the reasons I feel that way is because I've had personal okay. relationships. But with I people. want to push you just one moment. Push. You know that there are representatives of the Orthodox community who are very critical. By the way, one of the things we're dealing with right now is the way in which the Orthodox establishment in Israel, the chief rabbinate, which is ultra-Orthodox, and there are even members of the government of Israel who say very deprecatory things about non-Orthodox Judaism, especially Reform Judaism here in America. But, and the Masorti movement has been having terrible trouble. The Masorti movement is the expression of conservative Judaism in Israel. It, too, is having enormous problems institutionally with members of the Israeli government, the Israeli government on a municipal level, with the president of Israel, Reuven Rivlin. Rivlin and the, so there are many Orthodox Jews who would say, the problem with the non-Orthodox, the problem with the Reform Jew or the conservative Jew, they don't take halacha seriously. They don't take Torah mi Sinai, Torah from God, seriously. And if they are not taking that seriously, they may be lovely people, but I can't respect their expression of Judaism. That's what I'm asking you to speak to. One can respect every reform or conservative approach to Judaism that's sincere and heartfelt and thought through. I, I told you, literally, this sounds silly, but some of my best friends are reform rabbis. Even though theologically, I'm, I, I disagree with them. It's not, about I wish, you, it's not whether you like them yeah. individually. No, I wish I I'm could, asking you what you say about a different approach to Torah. As an Orthodox Jew, yeah. are you pained by the fact that the majority of American Jewry, whether they're involved with synagogue life and Torah or not, do not take Torah mi Sinai seriously. They do not believe that Torah comes from God in some literal way. They do not believe Jewish law, halacha, is from God. And therefore, they do not, they want, in terms of the spectrum of Jewish life, either they want nothing to do with halacha and Jewish tradition, or in, in, if you're a serious Reform, conservative, reconstructionist Jew, you take tradition very seriously, but not because you believe there's a God in heaven who said, don't eat pork. Mm. And I want to know from your perspective, and the reason I'm going here, by the way, it's okay, go. is that you have represented what is known colloquially as modern orthodoxy. And you've worked with Avi Weiss, who's been a pioneer in establishing patterns of non traditional, non-fundamentalist orthodoxy. You've worked with him. My sense is that you are, are a, a kindred spirit with him. So I want to know from your perspective, in contrast to more right-wing orthodox rabbis who come on at JBS all the time and say in a very lovely, lovely way, Mark, the problem is non-orthodox Judaism is simply wrong. The people who are living it are living a wrong form of Jewish life, and they ought to change. I want to know what Mark Angel says. Well, that's a good question, but I, I'm not sure I could accept the premise of the question. In other words, I always say, I'm an angel, but I'm not God. I think it's God's... Where's my premise yeah, wrong? Well, I'll tell you in a minute. <laughs> I think it's God's job to judge. It's not our job to judge. Right. In other words, if you... If there's a reform person, reform people who, through, through careful thought and studies, decides halakha is not from God, it's not their way of life, it's not my job to tell them you're wrong. How do I know they're wrong? Maybe they're right. right? I, I don't, I, in my heart, I think I'm right. But do I know with absolute certainty that they don't have a kernel of truth? Do I think God doesn't like them? 
No, I can't say that. I don't can't say that. I think God loves all sincere good people. And sometimes we all have, find different roads to God. And so my road, I think, is, of course, the correct road. But the next person thinks it's wrong and thinks his road or her road is a better road. I'm not here to judge them. That's why I'm saying I don't accept your premise. And I, I can't, it's not our job to say the Reform Movement or Conservative Movement or Orthodox Movement or Chiradium are wrong. It's, not, it's, it's a presumptuous. Who are we to say so? There should be some modicum of humility, intellectually and emotionally, to say, I am doing my best. I'm trying to understand truth. I'm trying to make a connection with the Almighty. I'm trying to live a good Jewish life so that my children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren for all the generations to come will be worthy of Torah and worthy of, worthy of being good Jews. But can I therefore discredit anyone who doesn't do it my way? I can't. I, there's just a different road. And so I, I don't say I'm in favor of that road. I wish everyone would be Torah observant and fine. But I also wish the Chayredim would also be nicer. There are a lot of Jews who follow all the misvot, but uh, are not necessarily nice people, or they're not honest in other ways. So who, we shouldn't be standing in judgment, and we shouldn't be saying, you're Jewish enough, you're not Jewish enough, you're religious, you're not. Let's keep it to ourselves. Let God be the judge. Our job is to live our lives as best as we can, and to try to impact on other people, and let them impact on us, and we'll see where the things fall. That's lovely. I want to come back to something you alluded to. Are you worried that as Jewish life progresses, the element of orthodoxy that is more to the right and takes a harder line will continue to increase in both numbers and in influence, while the orthodoxy that you grew up with in your home, the orthodoxy that you've aligned yourself with when you do things with Avi Weiss, which is a more but it reflects the attitude you just expressed, that it is an inclusive and respectful even of the non-Orthodox expressions of Judaism, that that form of Orthodoxy that you are now part of will become smaller and smaller, less and less powerful in its influence in the Jewish world as a whole, and that ultimately what we're moving towards as we talk about the rigidity in the Jewish world is that you will either find the ultra-Orthodox or the non-observant altogether. And I told you when you sat down, one of the things I really wanted to hear was how you view Jewish life today. And this is part of what I'm asking you. To what extent are you concerned about the extent to which a rigidity within Orthodoxy seems to be the only form of Orthodoxy growing while the Soloveitchik oriented Riskin and Hartman and Greenberg and Weiss and Angel that your expression of what Orthodox Judaism can be and, and can grow into will become more and more marginalized. And so I'm asking you what, what you see the Jewish future to be. I think in the short run, maybe let's say for the next 20, 25 years, I think the Haredim are the, on the ascendant. There's not a question. They have more kids. They have more institutional control, and I think that that's a fact. I think the modern orthodoxy that you have referred to, and that which I stand for, is on the defensive. I think we're finally waking up the modern orthodox, and we are. Avi, I started the Yeshiva Chovei Torah. I started my Institute for Jewish Ideas and Ideals. Um, Jewishideas.org. Yeah. We have it up on the screen. Good. Um, so, and I think that you have a, a Sohar group in, in Israel, and you have... Beth Hillel in Israel, you have very intelligent people who are trying to create institutional resistance to the Haredim. Right now, we're getting clobbered, agreed. The question isn't now. The question is 20, uh, 25 years from now. My basic faith is that Jews are very intelligent people, by and large. And there's no way that the Jewish people are going to live on the extreme indefinitely. For a while, OK. They'll be allow extremists to take some control, but not in the long run. In the long run, we're way too smart to let that happen. And there's going to be a, a pullback. It's going to happen. It didn't happen in this government of Israel, but it will happen in the next of the next, where they'll start taking money away from the Haredi institutions, where they'll say, the Haredi, you want money, go to work. Get your kids educated properly. Get jobs. Uh, it's going to change. It's going to be a generational change. It's not going to happen in two weeks. It won't happen if we pass one law. But you know, 25 years from now, it's going to look a little different. My feeling is, you know, 25 years from now, uh, Angel, Weiss, Greenberg will be heroes. Right now, okay, let them call us names. 
25 years from now, or 50 years from now, people are going to say, hey, there were people in those generations, that generation that actually were pioneers in a kind of orthodoxy that we can all live with. Yes. And I, so I, my faith isn't for right now. People say, why do you start this institute? You're fighting an uphill fight. You can't win. I said, I'm not writing for now. I'm writing for 25 years from now. I may not be here to see it, but it's going to happen. But people should know 25 years from now and 50 years from now that there were people who tried to resist this, this uh, onslaught of extremism, and ultimately we're going to certainly win. I can't imagine that the Jewish people will succumb to extremism indefinitely. It can't, it can't happen. Good for you, and I, you know, I applaud what you're doing. And as far as I'm concerned, you will, all you guys are heroes. <laughs> you're heroes today. Um, I want to ask you about a couple of contemporary issues and see where you stand and how you deal with it both internally, what I mean by that is in your soul, and how you deal with it institutionally. As we're taping this conversation, the Supreme Court has just ruled that gay marriage is now the law of the land and that a state may not discriminate against a couple, a gay couple that's been married anywhere in the United States. The Orthodox tradition has been clear. The Torah is clear. Homosexuality is a capital crime in the Torah. And I don't believe there are any Orthodox rabbis who are right now prepared to officiate at a gay wedding. But I'd love to know your sense in general about where you see the Jewish community in terms of this issue and where you'd like it to be. Well, I think the majority of the Jewish community is very liberal politically, and I think that many Jewish organizations were in favor of this uh, particular law. As an Orthodox rabbi, I would never perform a, a, a gay marriage. I don't think any Orthodox rabbis, are not, certainly not that I know of, would do it. On the other side, they're still human beings. <laughs> so there's always a question. You talk about egalitarianism. And that was, on one hand, we agree everyone has civil rights. On the other hand, we have laws, traditions, a lot of emotional baggage that comes in the way between what we think, what we feel, and, and, and practical things. So when the law was passed, I wrote an essay, not about gay marriage per se. I said, I'm, that's a, for me, it's a past issue. It's already the law of the land. OK, let's, let's go to the next step. The next step, what I'm worried about is in the olden days, when you had homosexual couples, they were private individuals, basically out of the public limelight. They didn't have kids. It wasn't a relevant issue. And OK, so you agree, you disagree, but there it was no issue, per se. They didn't get in your way so to speak. Now, because you have in vitro fertilization, you have surrogate motherhood, a lot of gay couples have children. So forgetting about the parents for now, what about the children? My concern is now, are those children going to be accepted as members as in, our, in our Jewish Orthodox day schools? Are these families going to be welcomed into our synagogues? You know, if they go to a Reform Temple, that's the Reform Temple's issue. But if they want to come to an Orthodox community, and many of them, I don't know many, but I, I happen to know gay couples who are orth really orthodoxy observant except for, the, except for the gay part. But they're observant. They want their kids to grow up in a, with Torah and Mitzvot. They want their kids to go to Jewish day schools. They want to belong to orthodox synagogues. The question is, how do we integrate this component, which we didn't have to worry about 25 years ago? There, was no, there weren't gay kids coming to our synagogue, our kids from gay fat couples. Now there are. So my basic argument is that if we're going to make, I, I think the last paragraph of my essay was, if we err, it should be, uh, we should err on the side of love and compassion. These are Jewish kids. We've got to bring them in. We've got to make them feel welcome. Is that our ideal? Is this what we would have chosen? It doesn't matter what we have chosen. It's, that's a reality. So if this is a reality. Those kids are Jewish souls, and we need to bring them in. From my perspective, that's fabulous. It's also courageous. Um, did you get any criticism for that position? I got, I got plenty of criticism, but I want to say also, I got plenty of uh, very positive feedback, mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. positive feedback. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's a, a lot of times with, when we have changes in outlook, changes in mores, it doesn't happen you know, instant. It takes a while for things to cook. Mm -hmm. And I think this homosexuality issue has been cooking for a number of years, mm -hmm. not just new. And whether people are for or against or however they're dealing with it, it's at least part of the radar screen now. You're thinking about it. And if you mull over something long enough, you're going to have to come up with some kind of resolution. You can't live with this doubt. So it's the easiest thing to say, it's forbidden. That's nothing to talk about. That's easy. And I say to those people, it's fine. I also think it's forbidden to have homosexual marriage. I agreed. Yes, but we have reality. These people want to come to our synagogue, and they have kids. What are we going to do with them? 
and you will accept them. We, we do. We do already. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I, I did receive a notice that in the school, in day school in Boston, they don't accept kids from Nokia families. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, I am also. They, 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 why? Why do they not accept those kids? Because they don't want other kids in the school to get, be invited to a play date, and they see that they have, the kid has two fathers or two mothers. They don't want to see that. <laughs> they don't want to have, they're, they're worried that this will become a bad influence on their other, other children. I understand. But it's a very delicate balance that has to be struck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about your experience between New York and Seattle? And when you began talking about this, in my mind I was saying to myself, you and I have talked about the rigidity in the Jewish community. There's another, in my mind, a real shortcoming. So much of Jewish life comes out of the corridor along the East Coast. There is a vast Jewish population in this country that doesn't live in the East Coast. And that what Jews experience in the Midwest, on the West Coast, is so different in nature than what Jewish life is in New York. And very often, Mark, New York Jews assume that what we experience, that's Judaism throughout the country. Mm -hmm. You've seen it, you've experienced it in a different way. Could you speak a moment about the difference you've experienced between Judaism here in New York, and, and again, the, you know, from Boston down to DC, down to Atlanta, down to Miami, as opposed to the Judaism that is expressed, the Jewish life, the real Jewish life, sociologically, that exists in Seattle. Well, I'll tell you one of the shocking things in my life. When I was in, grew up in Seattle, I think the Jewish population was about twelve or 13,000. Now it's gotten to closer to 50,000. But when I was little, it was a relatively small Jewish community. And we lived, you know, we were a minute, minute minority in, in the city of Seattle. And we were very conscious of being a minority. Uh, when I came to New York, the first Rosh Hashanah I was here, I spent in uh, Crown Heights, which was then not just Hasidic, they had regular Orthodox Jews too. And they, I went to Prospect Park for what they call Tashlich. And in Prospect Park, there must have been a couple hundred thousand people, Jews, saying this special prayer to, to, of uh, getting rid of their sins. And my eyes just opened. I, I never saw so many Jews in my life. I, I was stunned. I was like flabbergasted. I saw more Jews in that one park than, <laughs> and, you know, 10 times as many as were in all of Seattle. Yes. So the difference is that in New York, you feel Jewish. There's a Jewish presence. Even if there's a bagel shop, there's a, even if they're not Jewish, even if they're not religious, there's a, a Jewish something in the air by, sheer, by the sheer number of Jews in, the, in town. You don't feel like totally an alien. You don't feel like you're totally an outsider. There's, in Seattle, it's a goyish town. Yeah, there's the, there are Jewish things, but you hardly see any visible signs of being Jewish. You've got to work at it. On the other side, in a small community, you have to rally together, otherwise you disappear as Jews. So in small communities, they have more of a, a pull to belong to the synagogue or belong to the JCC or do something, give a, contribute to the federation, something just to feel part of it, or they just disintegrate. But there's a, a greater feeling of holding on to something. In New York, you could be, feel very, very Jewish and not pay dues to anything. And you just by being here, you feel more, more Jewish. So I think that part of the, the psychology of, of Eastern Jews is actually a, pl a, pl a plus being more comfortable with their Judaism. Uh, in Seattle, we never wore a kippah on the street. Unheard of. When I was a kid, no, the most religious Jews, everyone, no one wore a kippah. Even Orthodox Jews. All the, all the Jews that I knew. Some very well pious Jews would wear a cap or something. But a kippah on the street, when I was a kid, I don't remember ever seeing it. I went to public school for high school. I never wore a kippah. I, when I come to New York, you wear a kippah, okay, it's not a big deal. So it's a different, um, subtle, but, but very real. Absolutely. Difference. Also, speak about the issue of intermarriage, because my understanding is, especially in the non-Orthodox movements throughout the country, and now we're talking about, again, the West Coast, but not only the West Coast. Uh, intermarriage, assimilation intermarriage is almost the norm of Jewish life today. But as a result, synagogues have had to make accommodations for the membership that exists. It comes back to what you sort of said about how you think orthodoxy should treat the gay couple mm -hmm. and the gay couple that now has children. What do you do 
with the extent to which assimilation, ignorance, apathy, assimilation, and intermarriage are now part of Jewish life in a very profound way that influence synagogue life. Mm. And again, it's not something necessarily an East Coast Orthodox rabbi has to deal with. Oh, we do. We but do. You, do you? Oh, certainly. Well, speak to it. Yeah. When I was president of the RCA going back to 1991, um, I made regional conferences. Uh, we had conferences in five different locations throughout the country with the question, what responsibility, if any, do Orthodox rabbis have towards intermarried couples? Mm -hmm. and, we, and we had uh, hundreds of rabbis nationwide participate, and we all sent in their thing. And I was uh, skewered for that. This was in 1991. Why was I skewered? I was called the, the Rosh Yeshiva, why you called me? I had to come to a special meeting. They were going to hang me. Why were they going to hang me? Because Orthodox rabbis shouldn't even talk about intermarriage. And there's no such thing. It's terrible. It's a, all, there's nothing to talk about. It's forbidden. If someone intermarries, they're traitors, and we shouldn't even talk to them. So I, I answered back. I was younger in those days and a little bit more flippant. I said, have you ever sat with a couple where the, Jew, the Jewish partner is very Jewish? They came to an Orthodox synagogue. They didn't go somewhere else. They wanted to be part of the, our community. And for whatever reason, they fell in love with a non-Jewish woman or a Jewish woman fell in love with a non-Jewish man. And they're in your office crying. Have you ever spoken with them? We don't have to speak with them. We just have to, we know what the law is. I says, no, no. If you don't actually see the people and talk to them and don't know what their issues really are, then you can't pass judgment. So if, we could just say, well, go to the Reformed Temple. Go, go, don't be Jewish anymore. That's not our answer. Our answer has to be, given the situation that we wouldn't choose, we're not in favor of this, but it's a reality. How should Orthodox rabbis deal with this? It's not an illegitimate question. And maybe the answer is we shouldn't do anything. But the other answer may be, should we try to work to convert the non-Jewish partner? Should we try to let them join, even if, not, not, uh, even if they're intermarried, maybe eventually they'll become Jewish? Should we worry about the children that are going to yet to be born? These are questions. It can't just be d dismissed, uh, we're not responsible. We are responsible. So the rabbis didn't like my answer. They, they were very unhappy with me. But that's basically still my philosophy. When I first came, the synagogue had a rule not to call a man who is married out of the faith to the Torah. So if you have a man married to a non-Jewish woman, um, this person would not get an aliyah. Did that change? It changed. What we basically changed the rule is we said a, a man married to a non-Jewish woman in Korn Halakha it has no status. It's not a marriage. So when we call the man to the Torah, we call him up as Habahur, as the unmarried man. <laughs> That's how we solved it. Or if he's over a certain age, we call him Hag ha Adon, the gentleman. So we simply don't acknowledge that there's a wedding, that there's a marriage. We call him up as though he's still a, an unmarried Jewish man. And what would you call him if he were married? Hagavir. Okay. Um, do you have many, did you have many, do you have many as Sheriff Israel who are married to non-Jews? I wouldn't say many, but we've always have had some. None of them were <clears throat> offended by this decision? Actually, many of them were very happy because before they were excluded altogether. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so now this gave them an, 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 an mm -hmm. uh, and if you call them, most of them are old enough, you call them Ha'adon, it's a very nice title. Mm -hmm. You call them, the, the, so they're very actually happy. But we've had several members who are intermarried who recuse themselves. They say, I don't want an Aliyah. I, okay. I'm not worthy of an Aliyah. Mm -hmm. So that, that's another thing. Okay. Look, there are a lot of problems in life, a lot of situations in life that we wouldn't choose, we don't approve of, we don't like. But if they're there, we have to deal with them. You know? So you have to deal with them in the best and most intelligent way. So on the issue of conversion, for example, I'm very, very liberal in the matter of conversion. I think we should follow halakha, but I follow my, my rabbinic models, Rabbi Ben Sion Uziel, who was a very, who was a Sephardic chief rabbi of Israel when Israel was founded as a state. And he was very open and compassionate. And he said, we have to worry about the children yet to come. We have to worry about the wholeness of the Jewish people. We have to expand rather than contract our options. And that's, that's my feeling. So within the Orthodox world today, certainly the Haredi world doesn't share my views. And certainly the chief rabbi it doesn't. But most Orthodox rabbis on the street who actually deal with people, they agree with me. The only question is if they could get enough courage to buck the uh, right wing. But I think most rabbis actually agree with me. I asked you what your feeling is about the widespread ignorance, apathy, assimilation, intermarriage, all part of one package. Mark, where do you see Jewish life going? And to what extent... You know, does this really worry you? To what extent do you say to yourself, it's all going to work out? Both. It really worries me. On the other side, it will work out. How do I know it'll work out? Because 
We've been around for 3,000 plus years. We'll be around 3,000 plus more years. We're going to survive. We'll be fine. However, in the short run, a lot of cases, a lot of people are at stake. A lot of people will drop out and be lost. It's happened in every generation. It's going to happen more in the future generations. We're losing certain element of the Jewish people. I think that's happening. On the other side, sometimes people say, well, they intermarried. They're, they're no longer interested in Judaism. They're assimilated. That's not true either. There are plenty of people who have intermarried who are fiercely Jewish, strongly Jewish. And it's an insult to just write them off and say that their Jewishness doesn't count to them. They fell in love with somebody. And, you know, it's... Uh, we live in a world where Jews are 2% of the Americans, and 98, they have a much greater chance of meeting a non-Jewish person than a Jewish person. And it happens. And it happens not just to Jews and, uh, and non-Jews. It happens in all religions and all races. In America, people marry out. That's, I think, the norm for all Americans, not just for Jews. So the question isn't these bad people who intermarry. The question is, yes, we're not in favor of intermarriage, but a lot of them have very strong Jewish connections still. It's harder for them to convey that to their children because there's a non-Jewish spouse involved, a non-Jewish parent, but it's possible. So as a Jewish community, we need to keep these people as part of the fold, part of the team, and some of them we're going to lose for sure, some of them we're going to win. At the same time, there are many non-Jews who are becoming Jewish, and somehow whenever they make uh, uh, t polls of American Jews, how many American Jews there are, how many, how many American Jews censuses, and they forget, I think they forget, there are thousands and thousands of people who weren't born Jewish who are now Jewish. Yeah, we've lost plenty, but we also have gained plenty. And does it all balance out? I'm not sure. I don't have all the numbers. But we shouldn't forget that there are many, many people of a lot of religious backgrounds and racial backgrounds who are now Jewish who weren't Jewish 25 years ago. So I think Judaism has a very powerful message and a powerful communal framework that's attractive to people who aren't born Jewish. Mm -hmm. And I think we shouldn't think all is lost. We're going to fall apart. We're going to assimilate and disappear. I don't think so. I think we're going to stay strong, and I think we're going to lose some, and we're going to gain some, but I think 25 years from now, there'll be more Jews in America than there are right now. Wow. Unless the Mashiach comes, and we'll all be in Israel. <laughs> but if that doesn't happen, I, would, I predict that we'll have a larger Jewish community. Fascinating to hear you say that. Incidentally, I recognize that as an Orthodox rabbi, there's no way in the world you could or would officiate at a chuppah where there was a Jew and a non-Jew. But I'm asking Mark Angel, in terms of all the work you've done in the Jewish community as a whole, what would your advice be to the non-Orthodox rabbi? Should non-Orthodox rabbis now in some way be a Masada Kedushan, be the officiant at a wedding of a Jew to a non-Jew if the Jew and the non-Jew are saying to the rabbi, our intention is to create a Jewish home? What is your advice to your colleagues in the non-Orthodox movements about yes or no when it comes to performing or be an efficient at a intermarriage? My preference would be that there, no rabbi of any denomination should ever officiate at any intermarriage. I just think it's a wrong message. Having said that, um, one, one could, should speak to the non-Jewish partner to see if he or she is willing to convert to Judaism on whatever basis, even a simple basis. Um, to, then that's a, diff that's a different story. Or if they aren't willing to convert, say, look, I, we can't do the wedding. We have to respect our, our, our feeling on the subject. But it doesn't mean we don't love you. It doesn't mean you can't come to our, our temple or our synagogue. And, and uh, in the course of time, things will change, and, and your kids will be part of our community. There's, there's a way of expressing love and compassion without necessarily violating a basic principle. I think when rabbis participate in uh, or officiate at, at intermarriages, it kind of gives a green light, says, this is kosher, this is okay. And I think it's a wrong signal. Mm -hmm it's not likely any longer to be determinative. What I mean by that is, whether a rabbi does or does not participate, there's going to be intermarriage. Correct. And I know of no couple who won't marry because a rabbi says no. But they will know that there, there are, no rabbi sanctioned it. That's all. But the rabbi does then sanction their participating in synagogue life. Correct. But they always have in the back of their mind that their marriage itself wasn't um, sanctioned. And that's what you want them to have in the back of their mind. I do. I think they should know. There's a, there's a price to pay. You make the judgment. I understand. Love this stronger than your faith and whatever traditional background you have. I understand. Okay. So I can't have you at this table without asking also where you stand on Israel and how you see American Jewry and Israel today. First of all, in terms of your own views. And I'm now not talking about 
Haredi and non-Haredi life. I'm not talking about religious life in Israel. I'm talking about when you see how the state of Israel is evolving. And as you see it, it is right now fighting a BDS movement. There are those who want to delegitimize the state of Israel. There are those who feel that the state of Israel has not done nearly enough to create some kind of equitable, fair, just resolution between the Palestinian community and the Jewish community of Israel. Where do you stand on this, and how do you view at the moment the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and American Jewry stand on Israel? I think, I think Israel has a load of problems, but I also think it's one of the most miraculous countries in the history of the world. In a country which is so young, to have done so much and won so many Nobel Prizes and scientific papers and agricultural innovations and medical, in it's a phenomenal. Israel is actually a phenomenon. The, re the people of the world should be kissing Israel's feet. They should be amazed that a country could be as democratic as it is, given that it's surrounded by enemies and that's facing so much war all the time and terrorism. Israel is absolutely a phenomenon. Having said that, it doesn't mean that they don't have flaws. Every, every country has its shortcomings. Sure, it would be lovely to have peace, but Israel says, yeah, they're shooting missiles at us. How are we supposed to make peace? They're teaching hatred in their schools. They're teaching everyone that Jews aren't people, that Jews are monkeys, that it's okay to kill us. They're, they're, I, they're, you know, so it's, it's very comfortable to sit in, a, in our apartments in New York or in Chicago or in Los Angeles and say, well, we, Israel should give more to the Palestinians and this and that. But we don't live there. And the, ones, the people living in Israel who are facing terrorism every day of their lives have to deal with it. So I don't stand in judgment of them either. I, I sometimes I, I, I wished for a more um, left-wing uh, government, not that I'm a leftist by any stretch of the imagination, but more left of center, that would have given a different mood to Israel's sense of negotiation. I'm not wild about the current government, but the people of Israel are the ones who have to make the decision. Their lives are on the line. Our lives aren't on the line the same, to the same extent. Let me say one other thing. The lives of Jews in the diaspora are also on the line. If Israel, God forbid, goes down, or if there's a, the BDS movement is it's really basically an anti-Semitic movement, so we're all going to pay the price. They don't, they don't just hate Israel, they hate Jews. And uh, it, it's, a, it's an illusion, a delusion, to think that uh, you could be against Israel's policies, this, that, and the next thing, and that it doesn't spill over to the Jews here. It, it does spill over to us. And it's really, I think this BDS movement is largely anti-Semitic, not just anti-Israel, because there's so many countries in the world that are so bad and they don't say boo. And, and they don't say boo about Hamas who's shooting missiles into Israel. They, they don't, there's, there's so much corruption and, and crime in, in Syria and in Iraq and with ISIS and with Syria and with Iran. No, no, no BDS against any of them, just Israel. The only democratic country in the world. How do you figure that out? How, how could that be? The answer is there's something very mysterious about being Jewish and something that bothers a lot of people who don't like Jews. Mm -hmm. And so they could vent against Israel with the cloak of being pious. We're looking after Palestinian rights. But don't Jews have rights? Are we the only ones in the world that don't have rights? So yes, I think Israel could be more forthcoming and should be more forthcoming and should be indeed a light unto the nations. But I think Israel actually is a light in so many ways and no one's looking at the light. They look at all the mistakes and all the flaws and all the problems and no one sees all the beauty and all the greatness that's come out of Israel. And I think the best cure for those people is go spend time in Israel. Go see what the people are doing and what they're up against. These people who are negotiating uh, peace or for BDS, let them go live in the, on, along the Gaza border and, 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 and spend a year there and then they come back with their, what their opinions they have. Mm -hmm. The people who are saying the sky is falling say, look, on college campuses there is an anti-Israel movement. Within the Jewish community in general, a lessening of Jewish involvement, of Jewish engagement, of Jewish knowledge there is a greater sense of, of not caring about being Jewish. The best way to make Jews disappear is not to try to kill them, it's just to be nice to them. Mm -hmm. And Jews just are happy to give up their distinctive Jewish characteristics. People are worried that the next generation will not be as giving in terms of the philanthropy that has characterized Jewish life mm -hmm. and that has supported and made Jewish life possible. These are the concerns I hear all the time. And so, you know, as you sort of sum it up, what's your vision? What, you, what really concerns you? And I know you are an optimist. I am. But what concerns you most about the immediate Jewish future? And then what do you see for long term? There's a famous Jewish joke. It says, what is a Jewish telegram? Start worrying. Details to follow. 
I think Jews are always worrying, and the details always follow. Yes, we have to worry about anti-Semitism, anti-Israelism, anti-assimilation. Uh, we have all these things that are entirely true problems that have to be faced. But I would rather be alive now than in Germany in 1938. I'd rather be alive, alive now than in Poland in 1940, 41. We forget how much anti-Semitism was. We have people in our congregation, older than I even, who uh, remember they couldn't get accepted to colleges because they were Jews. They were quotas. Now, okay, there was anti-Semitism on campuses, but they're also Jews. Uh, in the old days, could you imagine Princeton having a kosher kitchen, or Harvard, or all these schools? They all, yes, we have problems, but we'll look at what we also have. And also you have, uh, are some Jews disaffected? Yes. But you also have the uh, birthright that brings so many hundreds, thousands of Jews to Israel, young Jews to Israel, who get turned on to Israel. Yeah, so they're negative forces. I understand that. But they're also positive forces. Who's going to prevail in the long run? I'm always on the side of the positive. I always think that in the long run, the Jews are, are too smart to let themselves be defeated by their own mistakes. So I, 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 in the long run, I think we're going to be fine. But, um, there's a famous statement by Benjamin Disraeli. Um, uh, he says, in the battle between whether human beings are monkeys or angels, I come down on the side of angels. And I always come down on the side of angels. You're fabulous. No, you are too. No, you are fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, by the way, it, your most recent book is the, this wonderful new edition of Pirkei Avot, Ethics of the Fathers. Uh, it is uh, statements by the great Rabbanim that are in the Talmud and um, Mark is part of a new commentary, the Koran Pirkei Avot. So, you know, we haven't talked rabbinics at all. The next time you ha we'll just sit and talk rabbinics. But is there a favorite verse you have from Pirkei Avot? I love all of them. Yeah, but give me one. Give me one. And it may not, if you're, it's wrong to say your favorite. The first one that comes to your mind is? <laughs> search in the Torah, search in the Torah, you'll find truth in it. So I think that if we search and we think and we look for truth, we'll find truth. You've been bringing us truth for an entire career. Thank you. Mazal tov, you kol tuva hatzlacha. Just promise me you'll sit here again. One I day, love God willing. I love having God you. Willing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Mark Angel, Rabbi Emeritus of the Spanish-Portuguese Synagogue in New York City, Sharath Israel, and the director of the Institute for Jewish Ideas and Ideals. Website is? JewishIdeas.org. JewishIdeas.org. As always, I invite you to be in touch with you. Any thoughts or comments you may have, please email me, write me, post on our Facebook page, tweet me. I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaya, my friends, to life. Education in Media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.